Hey guys, welcome back to Tabletop Glory. Today we're going to be talking about non-metallic metals a little bit, but mostly how can the non-metallic metal style influence using true metallics? Now, if you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, that is okay. Real quick rundown, non-metallic metals is the way that we have to paint metal in order to portray it as metal. Now that can sound really confusing. Essentially, if you were to take blues and grays and that sort of thing, you could, in theory, end up with a color scheme that you could paint to give the illusion of silver without actually having to use an actual silver paint. Now, what are the advantages of that and what are the disadvantages of that? Well, we're going to talk about that in today's video. So I want to go ahead and say that today's episode was inspired by a comment that was left in one of my live streams. Now at the time I thought I had settled the comment pretty good. He'd asked a question about how do you texture metal, specifically gold, and that is why the shield was already painted. I went ahead and did that for him right there live on stream and showed how I would add texture to gold. Now today's video is going to play off of non-metallic metals, but it's also going to play on how I texture metal. It's very important to consider the way that light reflects off of metal as well as the way that the shadows interact with metal, especially when you have an entire metal model, like a warforged or like what's seen here, a traditional model that represents traditional medieval knights. Something where things are not necessarily going to be painted, but it's going to be quite a lot of polished metal. You're going to have a lot of light ref reflecting around things, and you're also going to have quite a lot of the way that the shadows kind of are manipulated off the surface of the model. Now, I am by no means any expert. There's a lot of really great examples out there, both in classic artwork and as well as in some of the more exaggerated artworks of the 1980s. There's a lot of that kind of chromium type look going on in some of that artwork, and you can use that for pop culture examples. They tend to be a really good example of what you can kind of achieve using a minimum amount of colors while still getting your maximum effect. Now one thing to understand is that in a certain sense, non-metallic metals when you paint them are only really going to be like visually stunning from a specific angle and so we really need to go out of our way to give the illusion that our light source is only coming from one direction. Now when I paint with true metallics, meaning anything with formica dust or anything like that in it, I go ahead and paint in an all-around zenithal way where my highlights are all coming from above. So that way no matter what side the miniature is viewed from, it's still going to look good. And the reason I do that is because usually all of my miniatures are going to be used for war games and not necessarily used for displays. Now when I have painted singular minis in the past such as busts, that's when I kind of go out of my way to give a singular light source from a specific direction. But for the most part when I'm painting miniatures that are going to get played with, I try to do a zenithal highlight from directly above as if to say that the sunlight is coming from high noon. Now when coating a large surface with gunmetal, which is a color by Vallejo, it is an alcohol-based color. Uh, it works really well with a pure black tone. Now with small miniatures like this, I like to use the black that's in the bottle, so I just don't shake it up. I let whatever has settled to the bottom settle, and then I squirt out a little bit of that pure black that is its base tone. Then I shake it up and then I squirt out a little bit of that. So we have our mixed up color and we have our base tone and I just coat everything in the base tone and then coat everything in that metal color. Then I let it dry and then I do a second coat of the metal color. And the reason I do that is I get one of the most pure metallics that I've ever gotten out of a paint. Um, again, if I was going to do a large miniature, I wouldn't do it this way. I would go ahead and just use a spray paint can, hit it with a little bit of gloss coat, and then go ahead and do the exact same thing, put that metallic on top of it using something like an airbrush. But for a small miniature like this, it's perfect. So one of the things you want to keep in mind when working with metallics is that when you bend a metal object, your highlight is going to go in the opposite direction of the bend. So that is to say if you were to hold it in front of you as if you were holding a newspaper and you were to take both hands and bend it backwards so that the arch is facing toward you, your highlight would need to be in the vertical direction. 
And I know that's a bit of an overly complicated way of explaining it, but a good example is to look at the arm and the shoulder pauldron here on this miniature. And essentially, the bend and the way that it wraps around the arm on that outermost edge on the side that is most exposed to the sunlight is where our brightest highlights need to end up. But we also have to keep in mind the fact that the legs that are directly underneath the arms are going to be reflecting some of the light themselves back up into the armor. So that's why the highlight actually wraps a little bit around the arm instead of just focusing on the top. Also, one of the places to keep in mind with where you want to put highlights, regardless of what side of the armor it's on and whether or not it's in direct sunlight, is anywhere where there is a sharp edge. You're always going to put some kind of an edge highlight, and that's just because of the scale of the miniature. If we were going for photorealistic, there's some places where you'd want to put it and some places where you wouldn't, but because we're doing a scaled miniature, this is a tabletop miniature, we're wanting it to pop on the table. We're not worried about doing this in a true non-metallic metal style. If we were, we wouldn't be using true metallic paints like what we're using. Another thing to keep in mind is this trifecta of color that I constantly am talking about. The trifecta color being you want a dark tone, a mid tone, and a highlight. Now our dark tone is our base tone in this case. Our mid tone is the tone that I put on originally. And now you can see me going back in with some of my highlight tone and adding that in. Now I do have a color that's brighter than that, but honestly in the final product it doesn't end up showing up. So I'm going to try to keep this relatively quick about this one part because I know it's going to mess with the camera because we're going to be talking about metal and I want to show you guys some examples but those are going to create some light refractions and that's going to mess with the camera. Unfortunately, I don't have the best camera and the autofocus thing is just going to mess with things. So let's keep this quick. When it comes to metal, we want to talk about texture and how can we add texture to metal while also still making it look shiny. For example, metal can, aluminum can, whatever you want to call it, it is still shiny. There are ways that it reflects and refracts and all of those wonderful words that my ADD will never allow me to say. It allows all of the way that the light interacts with this to tell our eyes that it is shiny and made of metal. And if you were to try to paint this surface, we would need to do alternating bright and dark colors, as well as some extreme highlights for the top of the ridges, etc, etc. The same thing with a glossy surface, such as my turntable here. Um, this does a really great job at, you know, catching light and bouncing it back at us. So what are some really awesome ways that we can use this to our advantage? That is texturing. And even if you want to make a glossy surface, we can still add texture by giving the illusion of the reflection of the room or the environment or even an opponent. At one point, I end up kind of putting a bit of a sharp line in one of the added reflections in the shoulder pauldron. Maybe the person he's fighting has got some kind of spear and it's it's this big huge pole and so we end up with these really interesting kind of reflections going on in the armor these are things that we need to kind of keep in mind to tell our story of this miniature and so there's two really great ways that we can add texture regardless of what color we're using number one is dry brushing that gives us a really nice dull appearance so that even when we're using the correct colors for non-metallic metal it kind of blends them all together and it gives us this dulled appearance very similar to the aluminum can number two is stippling and stippling kind of allows us to put color exactly where we want it it allows us to get these nice sharp lines so we get these tiny little wavy imperfections and that's kind of how we end up with this mirrored finish you can kind of see that even when you see my own reflection in this mirrored finish it's not perfect it almost looks like it's got a dimpled surface we can replicate that even with a glossy looking finish by using the stippling technique the colors that I'm using to replicate the shadows is nothing more than the original base tone. So in this case, it's gunmetal gray. Now you could choose to go a little darker than that if you wanted to, especially if you're trying to go for more of a non-metallic metal. You could choose more of a black tone like Abaddon Black, or you could even use some of your panel liner and do maybe four or five thin coats, which would give you a nice translucent dark black. If you don't have a panel liner, you can use something like Nuln Oil, but for the most part, we're just going back 
back in with our original base tone and using that to kind of create some of our shadows. Now if we go a little bit overboard that's not a big deal because we can just go back in with some of our highlight tones and kind of clean things up a bit again. Unfortunately this method of painting is not a pure science and I wish I could give you guys an exact formula on how to replicate something over and over again that's going to work every time for you. It's really a lot about manipulating the model around, seeing where you think light's going to reflect based on where you want your light source to be, and just kind of constantly playing with it and manipulating it. You'll see here that a lot of times I've gone back over things I've done and then re-added things that were already there because I wasn't happy with the change and thought that my original was much better. And that's just an unfortunate reality of trying to paint in a non-metallic metal style because there is no real pure science to figuring it out every single time. You just have to play with it and see what works for you. So we have a very interesting conundrum that uh, comes into play when it talks about the, the chest plate. And you could apply this to any kind of like battle skirt for any kind of like high fantasy anime-esque type armor. Multiple barrel shapes on chest armor, both front and back. So we have this issue where across the shoulders we have this barrel shape that meets with above and below the shoulders as well as along that bottom we have this flared out bottom and uh, that creates this really interesting shape especially with the fact that there is a divot that runs the length of the spine so for this particular armor I've chosen to kind of do the highlights in a bit of a Y type shape the connecting points between the Y is very much so going to be a place where I'll be adding quite a lot of shadow Really, we just kind of want to give the illusion that these highlights are there uh, without it becoming our main focus because we want the face of the model to be the main focus. So the idea here is that we're leaving enough to understand what the target goal was, meaning the highlights, versus going so overboard that people think the back of the model is what they're supposed to be looking at. So I want to go ahead and start this out by saying that I am covering everything in Vallejo Metal Color Gold. Now this has a lot of green in it for some reason, which I'm kind of a fan. It's a really nice, bright, vibrant green, which means it's great for edge highlights. Very rarely is it great for an all-over gold, but it is a good starting tone if you plan to add other textures to it. Now, originally when I painted the shield, I did this on a live stream to just show how I would add texture to gold, and that was not necessarily a non-metallic metal style, that was just me showing how I would add texture if I wasn't happy with the existing texture that was on the model. And the way that I did a lot of that was just with some uh, mild edge highlighting with some really vibrant golds like Retributor Armor, and then kind of slapping on a bit of a dry brush of Gilneas Gold and a few other things like that in a few random places to kind of add some horizontal lines into it to give the illusion of a reflection. And that was just again to add texture to the model. Um, but I wanted to take that one step further and use the techniques that we just talked about and apply that to gold and show you what that would look like on gold. So that's why the shield's going to remain gold, but I am repainting it. So once I kind of went around with my Gilneas and added it as kind of a loose all over highlight, I didn't put it everywhere, but I'm going back in with Balthazar gold, which is a darker gold, and I'm using that to reinforce all of my shadows. I'm putting a little bit of that in around the bottom of the shield to kind of give again that illusion that there's some kind of reflection in gold. Now the way that gold tends to reflect light is similar to how the polished metal of the armor would reflect light, um, but it almost diffuses shadows more across the surface and has more of a blurry appearance. So going with a dry brush or even just kind of um, almost like blotting it about the surface with a more wider range of stippling motion would kind of get you back here and then reinforce again any sharp edges using our original base tone. So that's why you can see me going back in now and kind of redefining the deer with again that gold and then I come back in with the shadows again with Balthazar and kind of knock that all down again and that's just that I get this real good transition between the high bright gold on the raised edges and the dark Balthazar gold beneath. 
Now I'm using Tamiya panel line accent color and the reason I'm using the panel line is because of the nature of the paint. The way it kind of wicks away from the surface and kind of hides into the crevices. It does a much better job than just kind of putting it all over with a regular general wash. And one of the reasons I'm using this also is it really darkens certain colors. So anything that was already dark before becomes infinitely more darker and anything that I really want a nice bright highlight on, I can kind of come back in with some of that. Now I ended up being fine with it just the way it is and as you can see any places where it got on a little thick, I'm just wiping it down with my finger and leaving it in the recesses. So there ends up being two changes here that I wanted to make right at the end. Number one, I wanted to add more red since I already had red on his shield. It needed to be somewhere else on the model and I looked at some traditional uh, depictions of knights from the old days and from the dark era and from many other depictions of knights and many of them had some kind of painting on their face, some had chest paintings, things that would help to identify them on the battlefield. So I ended up adding some red stripes to the face. I also took the gamison that is hanging out from underneath the chest plate and I went ahead and added some red to there to kind of unify all of that together. And I also went in and I actually took a little dry brush of some of our Balthazar gold very lightly and put that across some of the chain mail. And I'm hoping that that kind of gives it a bit of a brassy appearance. And then I kind of cleaned up anything where I may have made a mistake and then painted all of the leather. Now I'm saying this all in one go because we've covered topics like this before and I have a video that's coming out soon that actually will have quite a lot going on with it when it comes to how I paint leather and things like that. So we're not really gonna cover that in today's video. Uh, so that's why I'm just gonna go ahead and show you a highlight clip while I'm talking about it. And uh, hopefully you guys understand that uh, a video that is coming up very soon here will have all of that information in it. And there we have it. Uh, I'm really happy with how this one turned out. I don't typically do traditional style knights in shining armor. I tend to kind of do some kind of high fantasy style where I do colored armor or enchanted armor or things like that. And I actually really love how this one turned out and I think I'm gonna have to do more like this because I never thought that a traditional inspired knight would be so much fun to paint and I'm definitely gonna have to do some more of them. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support. I know that a lot of you have been asking me for a while to do some more organic videos where I don't take the voiceover so serious as well as you want to see more of me in the videos even if that means it ends up being a longer format video. And so hopefully I have you know, checked both of those things off of the to-do list in today's video and you guys really enjoyed it. As always, if you did enjoy, please hit the like button because it does help. Or if you don't like it, hit the dislike button because that also helps and it tells me what you do and don't want to see. If you have any suggestions for future videos, please consider leaving them in the comments below. And if you do inspire a video, and I will be uh, more than happy to shout you guys out in the next video. Or you can just come hang out with us on the lives on TikTok every Saturday night. I try to start around 10 o'clock and I just stream until I'm too tired to paint anymore. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support, and as always, may your display case always be filled and your pile of shame never run empty. Until next time.